It's me, Colt Boom Boom Cabana, and you're watching the Wrestling Roundtable. Congratulations. Welcome to a very special edition of the Wrestling Roundtable. I'm your host, Eric Santa Maria. Sitting to my left, which is your right, is my co-host for the evening, Chris Harris, as you know. But what makes this a very special edition of the Wrestling Roundtable is the gentleman to my right, which is your left, Colt Boom Boom Cabana. He's been a wrestler for 11 years and a fan first of 26 years, another Ring of Honor alumni to join the table. And before we move on to our special two-on-one conversation, I want to remind everybody to go to WrestlingRoundTable.com. You can find out more about the show. You can get the links to our MySpace, Facebook, and now Twitter account. And you can also shop to get the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt, help support the show. And there's lots more for you to find at WrestlingRoundTable.com. And the first thing I think a lot of people are going to be saying when they watch this show is, are you going to TNA? But we're not going to get there yet. <laughs> we'll get to that later on. And I want to start from the beginning. What made you a wrestling fan growing up as a kid? My first memory of wrestling was watching Andre the Giant get his hair cut in a handicap match. And that was my first actual memory sitting on the ground. My father had it at the time. And I remember sitting in front of my dad's television while he was in the room watching it. That was 84, so I guess I was three or four years old at the time. And I was, I was stuck, I was hooked, and uh, I loved it ever since, I loved it growing up. I always considered myself an athletic kid, I played all the sports, baseball, football, hockey, soccer, and um, it was interesting because I always saw two different worlds, pro wrestling and amateur wrestling. The amateur wrestling never really interested me, but professional wrestling, I always loved, and I always was upset because as a kid, you can get into all these sports that you eventually go on to do them professionally, but you can never get into professional wrestling until you're 18 years old, mm -hmm. and that always dug at me. It had to take me until I was grown up enough to my pit where my parents would, would sign me off and allow me to train, so it's always been my passion. Who were your favorite wrestlers growing up? What were your favorite memories? I loved wrestlers and wrestling. Anyone who was a wrestler was way cooler than I was. Even and Coco Beware? E especially <laughs> Coco Beware. Uh, like I always say, you know, like even Barry Horowitz, all I wanted to do was meet Barry Horowitz in a store, like in the mall somewhere. And Terry Gibbs, Buck Quartermain, I love Buck Quartermain. I still love Buck Quartermain. Often? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, anyone who was a wrestler was, was awesome, was cool to me. Larger so, than life. Larger mm -hmm. than life, yeah. And they got to go and be in a wrestling ring and wrestle professionally, and I couldn't. I had to sit in high school or in junior high and daydream about it. And I obviously grew up on WWF. I watched WWF, Global, WCW, NWA, World Class. Anything you could get Any, your hands Exactly. On. Windy City Wrestling was on Sports Channel Chicago, like anything. Even those guys were, were way cooler than I was because they were doing it. And it, to me, it was all just the same, but... Wrestlers are wrestlers. Yeah, but WWF, obviously, to me, was the main one that I watched and grew up, and my dad took me to. My, my dad wouldn't take me to the UIC Pavilion to see NWA and WCW, and I know I miss Steamboat versus Flair, uh, and I wanted to go, but my dad was like, no, we're not going to the Pavilion. We'll go to Rosemont Horizon, I'll take you there for WWF, but that's it, like, that's the show we're gonna go to. I did love them all, but I grew up in WWF, but every wrestler was awesome to me. So being that you had it in mind that you loved wrestling and you wanted to be a wrestler for so long and you'd been waiting on it, it wasn't that much of a step to start looking into schools in the area and maybe get involved? My dad actually took me to Windy City. He knew that that was my dream, my passion. When I was 16 or 17, he took me to the school and he got in a fight with the promoter. Uh, <laughs> so obviously I didn't train there right away because mm -hmm. he got in a fight. We went to their place where they filmed their studio TV and where they were training and actually clicked there. Wow, I could actually be a wrestler. Wow, that was my first realization. Then when my dad took me to Windy City, then eventually when I was in college playing football for Western Michigan University, and I said to myself, I can't take this anymore. I need to start my wrestling career because my parents always said that I had to finish college before I started wrestling. I said, okay, but just I couldn't take it anymore. And then it became a reality, like I have to start wrestling. And that's when I did the real research and found Steel Domain Wrestling in Chicago. What are some of your memories uh, with CM Punk from training with Ace Steel together, various indies, Ring of Honor, WWE together? Yeah, well, when I started training at the Steel Domain with Ace Steel and Danny Dominion, he was hurt. He had come in to give Danny and Ace the keys. And I remember sitting outside looking at him. He was so scuzzy. 
and he had like dirty shirt and these dirty jeans and tattoos. Was? Yeah, Not much. really. <laughs> His hair dyed. And I was like, man, look at this guy. And he had the hottest chick with him ever. Man, look at this guy scored like, you know. So he's been with the hot chicks for all. Yeah. He's going back right. then. No, now we know nothing new, right? <laughs> it's the story of his life. That was my first memory of punk. Eventually then, when I started training, he had then come back from his injury and we met together. And because we both were so passionate about wrestling, from there we grew, we, we went on wrestling shows. We wrestled each other over a hundred times by the time we were three years in wrestling. We grew together and then we eventually came to Ring of Honor together as the Second City Saints. Our careers kind of grew together as we grew as people and friends. Chris just put it so perfectly. It's amazing to think that this guy you just met four months into his training and you click, you wrestle all over the country, all over the world, you end up in WWE together. So now Punk is going to be fighting The Undertaker. What do you think about that? He's made it. He sure has made it. And it's not surprising. I just assumed we'd both eventually get there. Maybe I just thought everybody had the same dream, drive, and motivation and passion that both of we did, that we both did, sorry. But as we kept on doing it and motivating and pushing ourselves, we realized that not everyone did have this passion. And so it was only a matter of time, I thought, if we just kept on going and kept on pushing and kept on striving, that that would be our destination. And obviously we had two different forks in the road and Punk's gonna go wrestle The Undertaker, uh, which is great, I'm so proud of him, I'm so happy for him. But it's not like I didn't see it coming. I knew eventually he'd be there. It just it was just a matter of time, really. Well, one thing I see coming is our first break. And we wanna take this break now, coming back more with Colt Cabana. But first, we wanna take a special look at the Grappling Kings. Two competitors, one mat, one winner. A fight minus the elements that people typically associate with a fight. It's a wrestling based way of fighting. Grappling is submission based, it's takedown based, it's close contact based. It's exciting, yes, a little bit scary. MMA is basically founded on grappling. I'm glad to know that they are picking up jiu-jitsu more. Grappler's Quest is pretty known. I mean, it's it's a pretty big deal. Grappler's Quest basically is, has com had the best competitors and mixed martial arts fighters in the world compete for us. I want to experience that. You could really, like, you know, dismantle somebody without even harming them at all. We've proved already that people love to see grappling. <laughs> And we're on our way to show the world uh, what grappling can be about with excitement. And that was The Grappling Kings, new documentary from fellow panelist Rodney LeConte. But we are here today with classic, or is it boom boom now, not yeah. classic anymore? I've grown Excuse up, me. I've aged. <laughs> well, when you were known as classic was when you first came to Ring of Honor in 2002, along with CM Punk. And from there, you two grew exponentially over the next few years. It's a big word. But so did Ring of Honor. Did you ever expect Ring of Honor to get as big as it did? Because you debuted in the Murphy Rec Center. It was yeah. back in those days in yep. that sweat box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. I don't know why people wouldn't have it was such a great vision that they saw from the start for it. It made so much sense. The idea of bringing the top guys who weren't signed, nobody was really doing that. They did it for the one show or the two shows for the King of Indies for APW at that time, but nobody had done it as a set promotion. And that was gonna cost a little bit of extra money to start flying in guys. Because at the time, you were Chicago, you just used Chicago guys, maybe some Wisconsin, Indiana guys. If you were running New York, maybe you used some Jersey guys and some Connecticut guys, but you mainly used the New York guys. Well, Ring of Honor was now going to use the top talent from all of those states and bring them all in. And it just made sense. It was the top dogs. And if they were willing to put that money in, you could tell the product that was going to come back that people would be behind it. And they were. Because the talent was all young, hungry kids for the most part. I was 21, 22. Dragon was 21, 22. Low Key, 22, 23. Christopher Daniels was 40 at the time. Um, you know, young kids. And that was a decade ago. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. So they were all going to grow. We were all going to grow as wrestlers. So there's no way that the product wasn't going to grow. I definitely saw it, maybe not where it's at right now. I mean, what a great thing. You can't think that right away. But I knew it was going to be more than once a month in the Murphy Rec Center in Philadelphia. And if it was still once a month in Philadelphia in the Murphy Rec Center, it was going to be a packed house every month. I knew that. I, I saw that for sure. 
Do you think that WSX ever had a chance to make it? I loved the show. I loved everything it stood for. Kevin Kleinrock was the creator. It was his baby. He went out and he got MTV to buy his show and put it on MTV. MTV, what a program. I grew up watching MTV. Everybody has, really, especially my generation, our generation. They put it right before BAM's Unholy Union. That was their big guy, you yeah. know. Jackass was such a successful show, and all those guys had those shows afterwards, and they literally did zero promoting for that show, which is, just blew my mind. Why would yeah. you buy a show and not promote it? It had all, again, young wrestlers, gave them a platform. I thought they had really fun characters. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, with the electrocution and the piranhas. More like, like Barry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Putting the bands on there was kind of weird. It's MTV, but then you bring Zach Wilde over to do commentary during matches. You got to try to fish in those people. Like, yeah. The wrestling people are going to watch the show for X-Pac and Vampiro, but how are you going to fish in those people who don't like wrestling? It's worth a shot to try mm -hmm. to get the people who like the different bands, and then you get to watch the guy on band commentary. If you're not a wrestling fan, you're watching this random wrestling show that you know nothing about, but Zach Wilde or Chingy is doing commentary. You're going to want to hear him talk about yeah. wrestling. But then so. it goes back to the promotion if they don't. Promoted, yeah. how would these people ever even find it? If you have a great something and nobody knows about it, well then how are you going to make money or be successful? It's the key to America, it's the key to the world, is promotion. They put zero money behind it. They did a little internet, on um, internet wrestling sites, but again, wrestling fans are going to watch wrestling. Regardless. Yeah. yeah and, and they were up against DCW, I believe, too, at yeah, the time. Yeah. Well, WWE doesn't have wrestling fans. They have sports entertainment <laughs> fans in a universe. Yeah. And you ended up eventually in WWE's system. Sure. So you went through OVW, Florida Championship Wrestling, and WWE. These internet fans you mentioned before pretty much revile your time there. They just say it was the worst waste of talent they've <laughs> seen in a long time. And being the amount of TV time you got, it's kind of hard to argue against that. But the thing I wanted to ask you about that is this assumption we have right. about WWE and their restrictions and their politics and blah, blah, blah. Is it really as bad as we think? Because a guy like yourself, mm -hmm. who's been wrestling a decade or just a little under a decade at that point, mm -hmm. does he really need to be doing hip toss drills and back <laughs> bumps for weeks on end? You already pretty much know how to do that shit. Why can't they just see the potential in you and put it out there? Is someone getting in the way? I wouldn't disagree that going to developmental would be the right move. Maybe not for two years or a year or whatever I was there for. They have a different way of doing wrestling. It's not wrestling, it's entertainment. They want to teach you how to do their version of it, fair enough. Obviously, I picked it up fast enough, three weeks, I was ready to go in my mind, maybe not in others' minds. That's the way it works, so I'm not against that. Again, as you know, low key's down there now. They put a lot of very talented guys down in developmental, which is okay, as long as they're gonna bring them up and showcase them and let them do what they do. I had a lot of people supporting me there. A lot of people that said, man, Colt, you are hilarious. Man, Colt, you are funny, you are entertaining, you're a great wrestler. And for some reason, I wasn't allowed to go past losing to Kali in a two minute match. Mm -hmm. Is that politics? I, I don't know. Obviously, if there's a lot of people saying how much they love me, and for some reason I'm losing to Vladimir Kozlov in a two on one handicap match with Kung Fu Naki as my partner, you gotta assume somebody something's up. Somebody's saying no to to twenty five people saying yes. Mm -hmm. So that's such as life. That's how it works. That's the game that they play. Maybe I didn't fit in at that specific time. Maybe my journey back to Ring of Honor, independent professional wrestling, will allow me to grow as a person, as a wrestler, as an entertainer. Maybe it will go back and I'll be seen in a different light, or maybe do something greater with my career and greater with my wrestling life. You never know. So essentially. Going to developmental or signing a developmental contract is a gamble that wrestlers should be willing to take because down the line they could end up like Punk did. He went right. through OVW and all the trials and tribulations yeah. with TV and everything and now he's there. Doesn't happen with everybody, but that's the risk you take. I called it an investment in my future. That's mm -hmm. what I said. It's like playing the stock market. And to be honest, recently I've played the stock market and because this economy <laughs> is so horrible, I've lost a shitload of money. I invested in myself as a wrestler and developmental and I lost some money, you know, literally and figuratively and emotionally and mentally and all the other atelies. <laughs> but at the same time, I learned a lot. I was around a lot of great people. It wasn't a loss loss situation. I definitely won while I was there, while I was in the system. Made a lot of great friends, a lot of new fans. When I had the, the Scotty Goldman blog on WWE Universe, blog? I had a blog. 
when I had my internet show, I made a lot of great fans who had no clue who I was from Colt Cabana, and they stuck with me, and now I see them and I talk to them as fans, as Colt Cabana, and I push Ring of Honor to them. They've opened their eyes to Ring of Honor and all the great wrestling and independent wrestling that there is out there, and maybe they wouldn't have known that if they hadn't caught on to my humor and my entertainingness as Scotty Golden. You've got a documentary coming out soon within the next few months or maybe mm -hmm. sometime early next year, sometime relatively soon. <laughs> and what's that about? American Dragon and I, before I got signed with WWE, have always wanted to take a giant trip and just document the whole thing around America or across country, just driving. When I got released, we then re-brought up the idea of getting in a car and just driving around and doing shows coast to coast kind of thing. And what we did is we eventually set it up where we set up 10 days, Philadelphia, ROH TV tapings, Connecticut, New Hampshire, back to the suburbs of Philly, Cleveland, Dayton, and Chicago. We did seven shows, we did two training seminars all in 10 days, so that's basically nine activities in 10 days. Mm -hmm. We were calling it the Wrestling Road Diaries, and the website's wrestlingroaddiaries.com, mm -hmm. and we filmed ourselves on the road, traveling for 10 days, and it's gonna give the fan an insider's view. And I know there's so many wrestling fans out there that love to buy the DVDs and watch the matches, but they also love the inside scoop. Obviously, a wrestling round table discussion, uh, we're on the internet, and they know that we not only do wrestling, but we have the life's outside, and how do we get to the show, and how do we train, and what do we eat, who do we talk to, well, how do we talk to normal people, how do we talk to people who know us, people who don't know us. There's so much zaniness and wackiness, and I think it's a whole other life and subculture, and I thought it would be so interesting. And as it happens, it's I've been released by WWE, Brian has been signed by WWE, and there was so much story there, and we brought Sal Renaro with us, who we all just love why? Sal. Why? I don't know why, I don't know why, but he's <laughs> Sal is such a blast, he's such a great guy to be around. We just wanted Sal to be with us, and so he came with us, and he was on the shows, and he adds to the funness of this DVD, and it's just all of us driving in a car, driving all around, and you just get to see how our life works, and I think that's an interesting piece, and I think people would be interested in that, and so we're going to present it to them. There was taping going on last night at Glory by Honor in New York at the Manhattan Center for Danielson's last match. Right. That was a huge show. It's not just two Joe Blows. People think that I'm maybe a millionaire from WWE, probably not after they saw my performance. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're driving my Honda Elantra this whole time, and we sleep on floors, and we sleep in people's friends' houses. We finagle different meals. I think it's such a great piece, and we're happy to present it to the world to see. Why do you think that uh, wrestling documentaries, they only gain notoriety if it focuses on the negative aspect? Well, like, beyond the mat. Right. Yeah. Everyone wrestling always Wrestling with shadows. Well, well yeah. wrestling with shadows to lesser extent, yeah. but even the wrestler, when it gets yes. mainstream, it's mm -hmm. always something focused on negative shit. Like, yeah. look at this washed up drug addict. With Beyond the Mat, you ask anybody, what do you remember? Everybody's gonna say, Jake the Snake, smoking crack. I remember <laughs> the ketchup. <laughs> what is ketchup? Well, even Terry <laughs> Funk, when they looked at him, everybody loves Terry Funk, but the whole idea is this guy, and this was 10 years ago, right. is broken down and way too old, and he spent time away from his family, and it's just, even Mick Foley, Mick Foley, who's the most lovable guy, mm -hmm. ends up looking like an idiot because he got massacred in front of his kids. It always seems that you never hear the good right. mainstream stories when they look at wrestling. Well, the, the story is that we're these larger-than-life guys who everyone looks up to, and where's your story going to be? Obviously, it's let everyone know that these guys aren't larger-than-life and aren't they're human. Right, mm -hmm. they're human. I, it's a human piece. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I guess, where these people find these stories, and that's what they want to see. In this documentary, it's interesting because we're all sober, we don't drink, we don't do drugs, so there's none of that going on, which I can't say is the norm in professional wrestling, but I think it makes it interesting mm -hmm. that this car is a sober car in the world of professional wrestling, when people will probably expect everyone to be high and drunk and smoking. They'll look like Kevin and Nash in that Max Payne documentary with a handful of pills laughing his ass off. <laughs> but at the same time, you have a guy like CM Punk, Straight Edge, on the top right now. So there is the interest of why would you want to see that? You want to see something positive for once. Yeah, but all the kids wear Jeff Hardy shirt. <laughs> <laughs> the enabler. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a positive piece. And depending on how the, ed the, editor, the editor can make us look horrible. <laughs> there's going to be negatives, because there's negatives in everybody's life, and that's how it works. But there's also positives in everybody's life, and we want to exploit that, too. Well, what 
are, since this is looking at the life of an independent wrestler, right. what are the best and worst aspects of being an independent wrestler? Uh, the best is my creative freedom. Mm -hmm. My freedom to do whatever I want with nobody telling me how horrible I am, which I had while in OVW. Uh, people telling me that I was horrible. Nobody yelling at me. Later on, it was a lot of, in FCW, it was a lot of positive feedback and constructive criticism. But there's no pressure as an independent wrestler to me, at least at this stage in my life, I have zero pressure. I can do what I want. I, I can be as creative as I want with no glass ceiling. The downside is money. Yeah, the, the money isn't terrific, and it's a struggle sometimes, especially in this economy. The money is down, and that's the reality of it, though. But you got to find where you're going to be happy and where you're not going to be happy. How much money is going to take you to be happy to how much freedom and creative output in your own lifestyle. So that's the balance you gotta find. And Dragon said it last night at Glory by Honor, if he can make enough money on this level to retire, he'd do it forever. But the reality is, is that a lot of us can't. If I could stay okay until I'm 50 and be, then be able to retire, that's great. But such a lack of security in the independent level that sometimes it does your head in. And you just gotta think like, man, I gotta be secure. Man, I gotta be secure. So it's a, it's a battle and it's a struggle. It's a final battle. <laughs> How rare is it to get to the level where you could be a full-time indie wrestler? It's hard. It's so hard. And people will tell you that it's impossible. Uh, I'll tell you that it's not impossible. I've been doing it since 2003, basically, and I got signed in 2007. And now it's 2009, so it's almost six years as a full-time wrestler. you got to live within your means. Being Jewish, I'm very cheap, so that works really well. <laughs> uh, but you got to know how to live, and you got to know your lifestyle, and you got to be a hustler. you got to go out there and you gotta find where the work is, and you gotta get work, and you gotta become a name, or you're that good as a wrestler that people are willing to pay you more than the average Joe Blow. They can get some dude to come in for 10 bucks, but why are they gonna pay Colt Cabana a billion times more than that? Because I got a billion dollars. Uh, a billion times, I got 10 billion dollars. Uh, you know, why are they gonna pay Colt more than average Joe Blow? And I've gotten to the point, and people need to get to the point that promoters need them on their show, because it's important to the show to make money and to be a great show if you wanna bring them back Every time you're gonna bring in Colt Cabana, he's gonna put on a great show, entertain the people, whereas the people in the stands are gonna go, wow, that was great, I'm coming next time, I wanna see Colt again, he was awesome. So that's the kind of point you have to get to. It's not impossible, but it's very hard. It's a little more rare than the norm, isn't it? It's very rare, but there's people out there that can do it, you mm -hmm. can do it. You just have to be persistent, you have to have a goal, you have to see it in mind, you have to follow through, and you have to love what you do. It's very hard. I mean, Crowbar just put out a press release saying that it's impossible. You can't do it. But here I am doing it, I'm doing it for six years now, even mm -hmm. before I was with WWE. And you're not alone. And I'm and not hopefully alone. Hopefully we are not alone. Hopefully you're enjoying the show because we're coming back with more with Colt Cabana. I know her. Olivia? Olivia oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah look, that's how I know her. <laughs> <laughs> Eric is an ass man, apparently. He is. Oh, he is. Yes, he's seen his computer. You, do you know how many pictures I have of her? <laughs> no, I do not. Is it that a convention that I haven't seen billboards for? Is it like four times her normal size or what? There you go. It's in Edison. There was like some huge porch. Olivia oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right down. Well, like, wasn't that last year? Oh, wow. they, did it, they did it again this year. Again? And there's, I missed it. There's billboards up and down the turnpike. I didn't see it. Because Gianna Michaels went to the last one. Yeah, like the... she's here. Oh, oh, yeah. like the... oh, that's my fucking girl. I know, I love Gianna. You know who my new favorite is? Yeah. Rachel Starr. Do you know that name? No. She has Look a great ass. Yeah. yeah. She has a great yeah. ass, but she knows how to fuck with it. <laughs> my God. She just stands there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, on the ass. All right, so... <laughs> We're recording this stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get still going. <laughs> Turn that off. <laughs> Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. We're talking with Colt Dribble Cabana. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is that we talked about your career in Ring of Honor. That's where I saw you the first time. And when you did go to WWE, you were one of the people I kept saying, that I miss who has left Ring of Honor. Oh, okay. Like Samoa Joe got to a certain point where he'd done everything. There really was nothing left for him to do, but other people still had some gas left in the tank and I really enjoyed your matches. In fact, I've said on the show before that one of the most entertaining matches I've ever seen in person was you and Nigel McGuinness at the third anniversary show in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, yeah. You're a pretty skilled wrestler and a lot of people just see the comedy though. Right. So they just label you as a comedy wrestler, which I guess is an appropriate label because you do a lot of funny stuff. But 
this match with Nigel showed me that you could integrate that with scientific or European style wrestling and have it be an overall entertaining package. A lot of people would probably say that someone like yourself would only get to a certain point though. In other words, they wouldn't ever be the guy. You wouldn't be the world champion representing a promotion. Is that even possible? And if it is, how would that be accomplished? Uh, it's interesting to say that. I do get labeled as a comedy wrestler and I love comedy in wrestling, but I never would call myself a comedy wrestler. That match in particular is a great example of how I define my wrestling style, which is a complete hybrid of comedy wrestling, British wrestling, Memphis wrestling. Even you know, high flying. Even high, right, of course. So many different elements of everything together. I wouldn't call my wrestling pure comedy per se. I love to put humor in wrestling. When I'm out there, I like to feel natural. I like to go with the flow. And as myself, in real life, I try to put humor in everything. <laughs> Sounds like you want to put something else in there. <laughs> so, I love British wrestling. It's not a secret. Two guys that I look up to and were my heroes in British wrestling are two guys named Cat Weasel and Les Kellett. YouTube them at home if you want. Cat Weasel and Les Kellett. And those guys, Les Kellett was on top as a major star main eventing the shows for years as a wrestler who puts humor in his wrestling. When I think comedy wrestling, I think Lucha Vavoom. Well, let me put it to you like yeah. this, because I've become probably the most hated person on the Chikara message board because I've ripped on Chikara on the show. Okay. Because I think when you cross the line of breaking kayfabe, then I mentally check out of this. I want to enjoy it as what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a line to cross in terms of kayfabe for comedy wrestling? I believe in kayfabe. When I wrestle, everything in terms of humor to be believable. Like, I can justify it. It's reality. Chikara, on the other hand, in my mind, and I just recently did a match in Chikara in New Hampshire where we played a baseball game in the middle of our match, okay? So you would probably hate it. That took a lot of balls. If, hey, four, to be honest. Chikara, the way Mike Quackenbush is promoting Chikara, I kind of see it as a sideshow variety show. That it's not just professional wrestling, but it's almost like a variety kids show. It well, sounds like pro wrestling to me. Well, you know, <laughs> I put that aside. In my Ring of Honor matches and when the show is promoting pure wrestling or wrestling, that I want to justify everything. I, I understand where you're coming from completely, and I try to do that. Maybe just like a stand-up comedian would find his right stuff that he likes and then get rid of stuff that he doesn't like. If I like it, I'll keep it. If I don't, I don't. And I do like to keep the stuff that I can justify. And when that happens, I believe people are drawn to me, they like my wrestling style, they find me entertaining, and they want to come and they want to root for me. And when they want to root for me, and if there's a bad guy who does something mad, people will be upset. And I think that's how you draw money in wrestling, is when a bad guy does something mean to a good guy, and the people want to see their good guy rise up. Jim Cornette told me that funny does not equal money. Name drop. Name drop. <laughs> But it's important because Jim, Cor I'm sorry, I dropped that. Jim Cornette told me funny does not equal money. So many people have told me that comedy is not going to get you so far in wrestling. I could sit there and go, okay, you're right. I'm going to change my style to low key, but I just don't want to. It's not totally true, is it? Though? I, this is what I want to do. This is the style I want to do, and, I, and it's my mission and it's my goal to find that way to make it to where comedy where humor in my wrestling style will be okay as I can be a top dog. It might not happen, but I'm not going to go and do somebody else's wrestling style because somebody says that. And that's not a dig on Jim Cornette. I love Jim Cornette. Obviously, he's back with Ring of Honor now, and I'm so happy. But this is the way I feel. I feel that it has the ability to be on top. Just like Les Kellett did in England, I think there's a will, there's a way, and I'm going to find that will and way. I'll keep on doing it, whether it's successful or not. Who knows? I'm driven. I was driven to get to the WWE. I was driven to be a pro wrestler. I'm driven to make this happen and make it work. We've talked a lot about comedy, and last month you performed at the Hollywood Improv doing stand-up. Yeah. What prompted this, and is it something we're going to see more of in the future? Naturally, I'm a witty person. I like to think. You know, that's what my mom tells me. So uh, <laughs> Mick Foley was asked to do a show at the Improv, and the promoter asked me to open for him. You're a funny dude, will you do this show? And I'll pay you X amount of money. The independent lifestyle that I live, I said yes, of course. And Set. you're Jewish. <laughs> and I'm Jewish, right, so I'll take whatever. What a great idea, what a show, what a great concept. I'd be in my element, telling wrestling jokes as a wrestler to wrestling fans at a comedy show. And I loved it, I went with it, I went out to California, I love stand-up comedy, I've said that before. So to be at the Improv in Hollywood, a very famous venue, I had a blast, people laughed, they enjoyed me. I'm not saying this is what I wanna do, 
But if I can integrate that in my wrestling career and I can do this also and be successful at it, I'd love to continue trying and Always got to try. Yeah, I thought it was such a great idea. I'm happy to be a part of it. It's a great way to debut, though, at the Hollywood Improv. Right? <laughs> Most people go to, like, Chuckles and Whiteout. <laughs> <out. laughs> That's what I said, is, is that so many people have probably been dying to do the improv yeah. in Hollywood. And here I am, my first time ever, never have done stand-up How many comedy. open mic nights do people go? That's great. Dude. Yeah. Let's start there. I, it was a blast. Are we going to see more wrestling road diaries in the future, maybe with somebody else taking Brian's place? Is it going to be a regular series in the future, maybe? Well, obviously, Brian is going off to the WWE. When we thought of this idea, and there's a bunch of different ideas. We're going to see how successful the first one is. If it's successful, I'd like to be a part of different ones, maybe in Puerto Rico, maybe in Europe. I would love to be a part of different ones, and I think the interest is there. But we'd like to make Wrestling Road Diaries, I think, a brand. In this documentary, we see we talked to Colin Delaney, but maybe there'd be different wrestlers who do different trips in different areas of the world. Different experiences. Different experiences, yeah. And maybe it's not just from Colton Sale and Brian, it's from different people. So we'll see how successful it goes. If everybody buys it on WrestlingRoadDiaries.com, it will be successful, and then we can branch out from there. It's a project, and it's in the works, and we'll see how it goes. Well, speaking of success, we're going to come to the question I'm sure a lot of people want us to ask. There were rumors just recently about maybe WWE is interested a little again, but we know the other week you had to try out with TNA again. What's the future hold for Colt Cabana? How'd it go? Isn't that wild that WWE would be? Like, they just fired me? Like <laughs> They want you back already. Right? Like... <laughs> Oh, this Cole, then I'm sure they have no clue who I am. They're like, this Cole Cabana guy's good on HD You got like, mixed up with the boogeyman. Yeah, right? I did do a tryout. They wanted to take a look at me. It wasn't going to be on TV. It was a dark match. It wasn't interrupting with anything that we're doing on HD Net or Ring of Honor. It was just an in-house match for the people of Orlando. And that's as far as it went, or is, is it going? I'm not sure. This discussion's not even a week after, so I don't know. I love to wrestle. That's what I want to do. I want to wrestle and give the fans an opportunity to see my entertaining aspect without my legs cut off. Mm -hmm. And right now in ROH, on HDNet, I'm having fun matches, great matches that I enjoy. I love adding to my portfolio. So this is where I'm at right now. I'm on Ring of Honor, I'm on HDNet every Monday night, I'm on TV, and I'm running around the country just doing my thing. This is what I love to do. I'm having a blast doing what I'm doing right now. I don't know the future. The future is I'm gonna drink some of this water. <laughs> That's the future, so you'll have to see. Well, we had a blast having you on the show, and I want to thank you very much for yeah. joining us here on the Wrestling Roundtable. You're welcome back anytime that it's possible. But for the immediate future, like you said, you're going to be wrestling in Ring of Honor. And Ring of Honor is going to be coming to Collinsville, Illinois, October 9th, October 10th, Indianapolis, Indiana, November 5th and 6th, another HD net taping in Philadelphia. And look for WrestlingRoundtable.com's free giveaway tickets. We're going to have some more information for that on WrestlingRoundtable.com. I bet our Jewish fans would like that. <laughs> <laughs> but to find out more about Colt Cabana and follow him on Twitter, yeah. you can also go to Dr. Colt Cabana. And next time on the Wrestling Roundtable, we're going to be talking about SummerSlam 2009, UFC 103, and the best and worst of SummerSlams. And after that, we're going to have our season finale. So look for the next show, October 25th, and the season finale the week after. So for my co-host, Chris Harris, our special guest, Colt Boom Boom Cabana, I'm your host, Eric Santa Maria. Thank you, and join us next month. And join us on WrestlingRoundtable.com. Do it! <laughs> <laughs>